Okay. And, and like with the midterm, it's, it's straightforward. I'm, I'm, we're not trying to trick you. Um, if you study in good faith, you've watched all the, the, uh, the lecture videos or attended the lecture, read, done all the readings, attended tutorials, you should do fine. Um, one thing I noticed in, the, in a few of the midterms though, I would discourage you from using outside sources and focus strictly on the textbooks. Uh, as, as far as citations, I'm not requiring formal citations. You don't need to do like Chicago style or footnotes, but you do need to make reference to the readings um, in your essay questions, especially. You don't really have to do it in the, in the ID questions. You can if you want, uh, but in the essay questions, part of what your evidence is to prove your point is to use reading, specifically readings from the course document that you've been discussing in tutorial, right? So for example, you know, like in the first, uh, on the midterm, you know, if you were going to talk about reconstruction, you should probably be citing documents from that uh, tutorial we did on reconstruction. Um, so, but I would avoid citing external things um, unless you're really confident about it. Like for example, if you cited something from your essay, that would be okay, but don't cite websites and, and that kind of thing. Um, just try to stick to the readings and any research you did for your, uh, for your final essay. And again, just a reminder that the historical significance, um, it's important to know all the facts about the event, person, concept, law, whatever it is that you're answering. But the more important thing is the historical significance. Um, you know, do you understand what this means for US history? So a really good example I noticed from um, the midterm was things like, um, like radical reconstruction. Some of you kind of got that it was this phase of reconstruction that was taken over by Congress, but didn't really connect it to that failed experiment or didn't talk about how it was this kind of radical phase or sometimes didn't make the connection between congressional reconstruction, and radical reconstruction and that kind of thing. But the biggest thing is to talk about how it would, like in that particular context, how it was like this failed attempt at multiracial democracy in the kind of grand scheme of things. And the overthrow of it, of course, leads to a hundred years of Jim Crow. So you wanna, when you're doing the historical significance, even though you're dealing with a very specific person or concept or um, law or, or whatever um, event, you, you want to think about the big picture, right? Why does this matter to American history? Imagine if somebody in your family or a friend of yours who doesn't know anything about American history said, why should I care about Brown versus Board of Education, right? Which is, of course, the the uh, Supreme Court case that desegregated was the beginning of desegregation in the United States, at least legal desegregation, right? So imagine what you would say to them if somebody said, oh, I don't have to that's who cares about Brown versus Board of Education. How would you convince them that it's a really important, not only Supreme Court decision, but a really important moment in American history? So just always have that kind of at the back of your mind. And like, obviously, the more facts and more precise you are with your facts and everything you get right will make the answer better. But the thing you really want to focus on is what does it matter? It's the kind of like, who gives a shit kind of question. All right, so there are no more questions about the exam. Let's move into the lecture. So these are, of course, the final two lectures. Um, we're gonna kind of wrap up the, uh, the end of neoliberalism and kind of move forward to what's going on maybe in the next 10, 20 years, um, at least look at what is possible. Um, we'll also look at what could potentially be the end of the neoliberal era um, in, some, in, some, uh, in some respects. So, We'll start by looking at like the 90s and the New Democrats. We'll take a break and then we'll do post 9-11, um, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. <clears throat> we might touch a little bit on the pandemic, but just, just in the sense of, you know, could this be, could this hasten the end of neoliberalism? Um, what comes next? Nobody really knows, uh, but that's kind of what we'll do. All right. Let's get back to the lecture here. Okay. I'm just wondering if, yeah, I am recording. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do um, is start essentially in 1992, which is actually a really big year in American history. 1989 sometimes gets all the focus, and most of you have probably figured out why 1989 gets all the focus for understandable reasons. It's a tremendously important year in the history of the Cold War, in the history of um, the 20th century, in American history, in European and Soviet history, but even beyond that, in global history. It's a momentous kind of period between 1988, 89, 1992-93. So part of the reason I'm going to focus on 1992, I'm going to explain in a minute, but 1989 gets all the focus for the obvious that I just explained, right? It's the fall of the Berlin Wall, Eastern Europe kind of falls apart, or at least communism falls in Eastern Europe. You get all of these countries here that were once 
their own country, um, but not really that independent from the Soviet Union. For those of you that have studied European history, you know that in 1956, of course, the Soviet Union crushes an uprising in Hungary, crushes the Prague Spring in 1968. But by the early 1980s, things start to change, especially in Poland, um, where you start to see the rise of kind of um, this kind of dissenting opinion uh, within Eastern Europe. And you also start to see it happen in East Germany. That's kind of the key thing is when East Germany and West Germany starts talking again. Um, and of course, the Berlin Wall famously falls down in the fall of 1989. So all of these countries here, these former Eastern Bloc countries, are now essentially free of the Soviet Union. One of the things that is negotiated, particularly toward the end of Gorbachev's term, is that the Soviet military is pulling out of all of Eastern Europe. Now, part of it was because they couldn't afford it anymore, um, kind of an imperial overstretch with Afghanistan, the internal contradictions of the communist system um, that uh, was gonna collapse probably either way, whether Reagan stood up to them or not, um, basically brings the Cold War to an end. But part of the reason 1992 in some ways is more important, and it's for reasons beyond just what I'm gonna talk about in the next few minutes, is of course, 1992 is the final year that the Soviet Union exists. By 1993, the Soviet Union no longer exists. And not only have all these Eastern Bloc countries become more independent, or in the case of you know, Czechoslovakia, it's split actually into two countries, Slovakia and the Czech Republic, you're also starting to see the USSR break up. Now, I remember when this was happening at one point, not a lot of people really understood what that meant. Russia breaking up, um, a lot of people thought that Russia was gonna become a lot smaller, but in, in reality, what the Soviet Union was, um, if you actually look at it, it was, if we have here, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, right? The Russia was the largest of those republics, which is why the Soviet Union and Russia were often seen as synonymous, but they're actually not synonymous. The Soviet Union was all these countries and Russia. So if we go back here, Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, um, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Kaliningrad, this is actually part of Russia still to this day. Um, these countries, if you looked on a map before 1992, would have just been part of the Soviet Union. They wouldn't have existed, right? But after 1992, when the Soviet Union breaks up, what that means when it breaks up is all these countries now become independent. Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. And then if we go to Central Asia, Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, these countries become independent. Um, although in the case of some of them, there's still a lot of Soviet presence as we're seeing um, this week with the Russian troops massing on the border of the Ukraine. So the Soviet Union now ceases to exist. But 1992 is also important, not just in terms of global politics or geopolitics with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it's also the year that Bill Clinton is elected president. So the Democrats finally win the presidency after being shut out for three terms. So what we have in 1992 is the first year since 1917 that the Soviet Union ceased to exist. On December 26, 1992, the Supreme Soviet of the USSR voted itself out of existence, bringing the 40-year Cold War between the United States as well as NATO and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries to an end. Right. So now we're seeing the break of the Soviet Union. And then, of course, that same year, as I just said, is the year that Bill Clinton is elected president. Bill Clinton, for those of you that did the reading, is known as a kind of a different type of Democrat. In many ways, they're referred to as the new Democrats. He was not an old fashioned New Deal liberal like FDR or Kennedy or Truman or Johnson. He was a new Democrat. Now, this was a group of Democrats that were tired of losing to Reaganite Republicans. Right, Very similar to kind of what happens to the Republicans in the 1950s, um, which most of you can probably see where I'm going with this. So the party that dominated national politics for 50 years from 1932 to 1980 had lost three presidential elections in a row and they were not close. The closest of those three presidential elections was the 1980 election, which as I said last class in terms of popular vote was probably closer to what Joe Biden won the popular vote by in November. Now the electoral college, if you remember those slides, Reagan won by quite a lot. Um, it's just the nature of the imbalances in the, in the electoral college. But the 1984 and 1988 uh, presidential elections weren't close at all. Um, the Republicans basically won in a landslide in 84, and then George Bush Sr. wins in a landslide in 1988. It's partly because the Democrats nominate Michael Dukakis, who is kind of a weak candidate in many respects. Um, and he had a series of unfortunate incidents. Um, one of the biggest ones was probably <laughs> Uh, for those of you um, that know the image, you probably know what I'm talking about. One of them was, um, yes, Edward the Tank, 
So there's this famous image of Michael Dukakis for some reason doing a photo op while driving a tank and the helmet's on him and it's too big for him. So like he, he looks like a little boy playing with a tank. Uh, doesn't really go over well with the country. And of course that election is also famous for um, a political ad that is in many ways as notorious as the Daisy ad from the early 1960s, but in many ways so much worse. It's the famous Willie Horton ad. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about. And this is the beginning where Republicans have really started to lean into that kind of dog whistle, kind of race baiting um, that will characterize the Republicans, especially uh, in, um, in the 21st century. Although it's, it, ironically, it, it's not quite the same under George W. Bush. It's there. Uh, certainly, especially in the campaign against uh, John McCain to get the presidency. But for Bush, it became more, it became something different, which I'll talk about um, in the next lecture. So the Willie Horton ad, of course, is this famous ad where this, uh, this man that was convicted of murder, I think it was rape and murder in Massachusetts, um, was let out on a furlough, which happened under Michael Dukakis. And as he was let out on a prison furlough, he killed somebody. So this ad was basically blasted all over the United States. And, and the point was, it was a kind of continuation of Nixon's Southern strategy, basically trying to scare kind of moderate whites that if Michael Dukakis gets elected, Willie Hortons are gonna be running all over the country. Now you can probably see where I'm going with this because eventually that type of mentality will seep its way into the Democrats, um, particularly under Bill Clinton, not in the sense of that imagery, but especially when we get to the crime bill, which for those of you that followed the presidential election in 2016, that was a big issue for Hillary Clinton, um, was her husband's support of the crime bill, which as we'll talk about later in the lecture, led to an explosion of mass incarceration that was started under, you could say Nixon with the war on drugs, Reagan, but really explodes um, under Clinton in the 1990s. So, so the group of Democrats that I'm talking about here, the new Democrats, were tired of losing to Reaganite Republicans, right? And it's also important to note that even though Clinton wins in 1992, he did so largely because Ross Perot, the kind of eccentric billionaire from Texas, who, if some of you are bored, just watch videos of Ross Perot talking. It's hilarious in many ways. Um, or watch Dana Carvey doing them on Saturday Night Live because it's, it's one of the best impressions. And like you can't not see Ross Perot as that after you look at it. So he's this billionaire from Texas. He runs as an independent and he basically costs millions of votes to the Republicans. Bill Clinton only wins that election with about 43, 44% of the popular vote. Oh, well over 300 um, electoral votes. But because Ross Perot split the election, the Democrats were able to win. Would Clinton have won without Ross Perot? It's certainly possible. Um, but it's far more likely that it was conservative votes that ended up siphoning off to Ross Perot. Um, so it's, you get a kind of similar thing that happens in 1968 when, um, when uh, George Wallace runs and basically ensures that the Democrats won't win and Nixon kind of ekes out a victory. So we're seeing something similar here. We get a new Democrat, we get a, a kind of um, three-way election in 1992, and George Bush Sr. loses the election. So like the Eisenhower Republicans who took office in 1952 and accepted the New Deal as the status quo, Clinton largely accepted the rightward shift in the economy and embraced the neoliberal turn, both domestically and internationally. And like Nixon elected as a Republican and governing like a New Deal Democrat, Clinton was a Democrat who governed like a Reagan Republican. Although, as some of the week's readings explain, Clinton imagined this as a kind of softer version of what Reagan was doing. One, could one that could reconcile the expansion of the market economy and the increasing marketization of everything with a kind of progressive conscience, or at least that's what Clinton was going for. So we have the fall of communism in the Soviet Union and the triumph of neoliberalism that same year with Clinton's election. And as we'll see, the fall of communism in both the Soviet Union and the satellite states in Eastern Europe presented a tremendous opportunity. Hundreds of millions of people that lived behind a barrier that kept out the market economy and the U.S. capitalist world order was now open. There were fortunes to be made, and the market economy starts to expand massively. The European Union eventually will start to expand in a lot of these states. You get the reunification of Germany, um, where Germany always an economic powerhouse in Europe since the, since the end of the Second World War, really takes on a larger role that it has now um, within the European Union because it's united. Although for those of you that study German history, there still is quite a divide between East and West Germany. Um, West Germany, even to this day, is far more prosperous um, than East Germany is because of the legacy of Soviet communism. Now, 1992 was also another important year when we think of kind of world historical, kind of philosophical um, kind of musings on what it meant for the Cold War to end, what it meant for the Soviet Union um, to implode, what it meant for kind of the triumph of this kind of market-oriented um, 
um, new kind of political governing ideology. Um, when the opposite party takes up the mantle of the kind of shift that's going on within politics. So that was the same year that American philosopher Francis Fukuyama published his now famous work called The End of History. Now, what does he mean by the end of history, right? I may have talked about this at the beginning of the class. I can't remember, or was the other class. How can history end, right? Fukuyama basically argued that the end of the Cold War, but more in part, importantly, the end that the Cold War represented was the end of history. More specifically, that history was really about, or the end of history was about the triumph of liberal democratic capitalism. This meant that history had come to an end, in the words of Fukuyama. Now, on the one hand, as we'll get into a little bit, this seems kind of ridiculous. How can history possibly end? And Fukuyama himself has kind of moved a little bit away from that um, since then, right? So on the one end, this is ridiculous. Um, but what Fukuyama describes as the end of history tells us something about his worldview. He saw history as a march toward liberal democratic capitalism. And of course, the biggest barrier to its planetary dominance is now out of the way and could lead to a US-led world order, right? Of course, it's always been a US-led world order since 1945, but with the Soviet Union out of the way, and you got to remember, after 1989, there was this thought that eventually this would happen in China. There was this sense that, well, maybe history had ended, right? Again, depending on how you define what the end of history is. For example, if you go to the opposite end of the political spectrum, and this is where somebody like Fukuyama and the Marxists have something in common, is they would see the end of history as the emergence of socialism, right? So what we really mean when we talk about the end of history is not quite literally the end of history. Um, it's the end of a march towards something, something that you believe in. In the case of Fukuyama, it was liberal democratic capitalism, not necessarily neoliberal capitalism, but liberal democratic capitalism. And in the case of, say, a Marxist or a socialist, it would be the triumph of socialism. And that was kind of the end of history because class conflict would end and everybody would be happy, right, at least in theory. And in the case of Fukuyama, it was that the market economy would provide for everybody. Um, we'd have systems of exchange rather than power politics and war. Um, so in both senses, there is a kind of utopian vision about the end of history, depending on which one you subscribe to. Now, in reality, of course, there are people in between these two extremes, but this is just how to think of it. So on the one hand, it's a statement of tremendous hubris, but on the other hand, remember what 1992 must have felt like. The 40 year struggle that could have wiped out humanity was over. And then the United States appeared to be this triumphant victor in the Cold War, right? So the idea was, that history all of a sudden was coming to this end that the United States had been fighting for. So if you think that liberal democratic capitalism is the ideal, or at least the best political economic system, that all history is working towards the emergence of this, then 1992 would appear to that person to be the end of history. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is not so much because it's accurate. Um, and it's one of the difference between a philosopher and a historian. I think no historian at the time really believed this. And like Fukuyama, I think, meant it a little bit um, more as a it's kind of raising a question about what the future will look like. And of course, now it kind of looks silly, especially in the context of 9-11, the rise of China, um, kind of the reemergence of, um, of a multipolar kind of geopolitical um, hard politics kind of world. It does look kind of silly, but it does give you a sense of what that those early 90s were like. I mean, I was young growing up, but there was this sense that everything in the world was getting better now. Not exactly like after World War II, but there was this sense that um, the world was moving in the right direction, um, at least in that context. And of course, if we go back to what we were, I was talking about earlier with Bill Clinton, right, is that we're getting this kind of, the antagonisms between left and right were looking not exactly obsolete, but we're looking that the Democrats and Republicans were coming onto the same page, whether you liked it or not, right? So what's interesting about Clinton is what he does and how he's able to implement and move in this direction that Reagan was taking the country. Um, and this is why in many ways, the Clintons kind of fell out of favor with the Democratic Party in the last 10 years, because they were seen in many ways like, a, like an Eisenhower Republican, although Eisenhower doesn't really get criticized because everything was great in the 1950s. But I mean, Eisenhower for really conservative Republicans today probably wouldn't seem very much like a Republican, um, that he would have been seen as a different kind of Republican. And that's why Bill Clinton's legacy to this day, even though when he was president was regarded to be very successful, when he leaves office in 2000, he leaves with one of the highest approval ratings of any president leaving office after two terms. Most presidents kind of limp across the finish line, um, exhausted. And, and it's a certain, to a certain extent, that's true. But Clinton was very popular when he left office in 1999 and 2000. So 
If we turn to Bill Clinton, this idea that much of the 1990s did feel like the end or the beginning of something of this kind of new era, there was almost a kind of 1950s quality to it. The United States may not have been as economically powerful as it was in 1950, but in 1995, the United States was the world's only superpower. And its way of life, its economic system was spreading and reaching new places beyond the Iron Curtain. But this also meant there was no check on American power. It was a double-edged sword in a way for the global system of um, sort of the kind of international system. This is not to say that the Soviet Union should be celebrated necessarily as a check on American power, right? But a bipolar world is in many ways simpler and more stable uh, than say a multipolar world that will eventually emerge. Now in the 1990s, we often refer to this term as a kind of unipolar world, that the United States had moved from being a superpower to a hyperpower, whatever the hell that meant, but it was supposed to be more powerful than a superpower. And all of a sudden the United States could actually act as that world policeman. Whereas prior to the end of the fall of um, communism in Eastern Europe, they acted as a kind of world policeman in certain parts of the world, but now they could basically act anywhere and everywhere. And remember, this is pre-Putin Russia. Russia in the 1990s, was essentially a kind of basket case of an economy and a political system that's incredibly unstable. There was constant economic crises, and I'll explain a little bit more why that is. Um, but essentially, Russia on the world stage for at least 10, 12 years ceased to be a power that you really had to deal with. They had far more of their own internal problems. So for about 10, 12 years, the United States kind of stood as a colossus, in some ways comparable, at least militarily, to the United States in 1945. Economically, the world is still multipolar. And this is something that's interesting to consider, is that economically, the world was multipolar before it's becoming multipolar when it comes to military power, which is actually what you could argue is happening today. So what I'm going to do is not go through all the various machinations of the Clinton White House. I'm not really going to talk about the scandal um, that much uh, or the Monica Lewinsky thing. But what I am going to do is focus on two aspects of Bill Clinton's domestic and also his foreign policy to kind of give you a sense of what kind of new Democrat he was, what the 1990s were kind of characterized and what it meant for kind of these neoliberal right-wing reforms to kind of move its way into the Democratic Party, what that meant for the United States. And we'll show kind of examples of it that kind of characterize this shift. So if we look domestically, the kind of key things that we're gonna focus on here is the infamous crime bill of 1993, 1994, and something that sounds a lot more mundane, but in many ways is evocative of this move to kind of not just financialize the economy, but to introduce these kind of increasing market reforms that were brought in starting with Jimmy Carter and implemented mostly under Reagan and Bush one. So if we look at the crime bill, Crime, of course, was something that was a huge issue in the 1980s and the early 1990s. It had really started in the late 60s, and I talked about this last class, when you started to see the success of these suburbs, when you got what's referred to as white flight, or wealthy citizens moving out of the downtown cores or into the central part of the city, into the suburbs, businesses follow. And so what you got was a hollowing out of not just the urban manufacturing, but a lot of businesses in these kind of urban centers that had always been centers of manufacturing were now in the suburbs. So now all of a sudden with all these kind of wealthy people moving out and the businesses going with them, it kind of hollowed out not just the tax base, but the economic base of places like New York City, Detroit is probably the worst example, Cleveland. Um, there was a kind of the deindustrialization process led to kind of de-urbanization between the late 60s and the early 90s. It picks up again in the 90s and the 21st century, but you have about 20, 30 years of this happening and it has disaster disastrous consequences for um, American cities. And again, the book to look at for this is The Origins of the Urban Crisis by Tom Segru. So because crime was becoming an issue, largely because of the economic hollowing out of these um, urban centers, it was something that was always on the minds. It's why the Willie Horton ad worked so effectively in 1998, even beyond its obvious racism. Um, and the image of what Willie Horton was supposed to represent, right, was this idea that crime was kind of out of control in the United States. Nixon talks about it in 1968 when he runs, um, that crime was just something that had to be solved. And again, we talked about this last class when you looked at New York City and what New York City was like in the 1980s. It improves, as somebody pointed out, in the 1990s. But by the early 90s, that hangover of crime is still there. So Clinton, trying to kind of worry about his right flank and getting elected not with a majority, right, tries to go rightward 
on this kind of massive crime bill, or at least try to split the difference. So the idea was to reduce violent crime, which of course everybody in theory at least supports. It had some things for everyone. For the Democrats, there was an assault weapons ban, which was I think overturned under George W. Bush at one point. And for conservatives, the bill eliminated Pell Grants for prisoners to earn post-secondary degrees. And crucially, instituted what's referred to as the three strikes law. Now this meant that repeat offenders in the case of, um, in this case, three repeats, carried long prison sentences. And since the war on drugs, first initiated by Nixon, but greatly expanded under Reagan, and brought in what were referred to as mandatory minimum sentences was still in full swing, many of these offenders were on drug-related charges and the prison population starts to boom basically. And by the mid 1980s, prison corporations looked at the balloon, sorry, private corporations looked at the ballooning population and saw opportunity. In 1984, the United States allowed private prisons. And now I can imagine, um, or at least you can imagine where this is going, like what the potential problems of this could be. Now, the three strikes laws combined with mandatory minimum sentences served to further expand the prison population in the United States, as the federal law was imitated by many other states. And that's the one thing to remember about the United States. Most criminal law is at the state level. There is criminal law at the federal level, but it's not like in Canada where criminal law is federal. Um, sometimes in, it's enforced in the provinces through like, or the cities, but the law itself is a criminal code of Canada. In the United States, it's a little bit different. You have federal criminal law and you have state criminal law. The vast majority of criminal law or crimes that are committed are dealt with at the state level, murder, robbery, these kinds of things. Things like terrorism, kidnapping because of state lines, fi certain financial crimes are often dealt with at the federal level or investigations into police corruption would be dealt with at the federal level or politicians and, and corruption would be dealt with at the federal level. So a lot of this when the states imitated is, is huge because it, it, it brings this same three strikes law all over the United States. Now, what this meant in practice was, let's say you were convicted of shoplifting once, and let's say you were convicted of simple possession of marijuana. And remember, in the United States, marijuana is a Schedule One narcotic, meaning it's treated legally as being caught with heroin or cocaine, right? So let's say you were caught again with possession. Those three strikes laws, two possession charges, maybe shoplifting or another possession charge, you can end up in jail for 20, 25 years. Now, of course, if we look at what happens with the prison population, you can kind of see this, right? So here's what the prison population looked like. And now you can see, of course, it's increasing much faster than American population. American population increases vastly in the 20th century, but you can kind of see what happens here. So the war on drugs gets initiated here. By about 1980, as it gets in full swing, right, the prison population just explodes in the United States. And around here is the crime bill. So it just massively expands the US prison population, which to this day is still the largest prison population in the world. And if you look at it here, in 1970, where the United States was still about 200 million people, you had under a half a million people in American prisons. By 2000, where the United States would be about 280 million, 270 million people, so about 70 million more people, now you have 2.5 million people in American prisons and jails. Right? So a massive, massive increase um, from when the war on drugs starts. Now, of course, the population of the prison was not necessarily equal. Many of these prisoners were African-American, Hispanic, or just generally poor. This is partly to do with the war on drugs. Indeed, the rate of drug use among whites and non-whites is relatively the same. But of course, white Americans are far less likely to be convicted of drug-related charges, mostly because white Americans are far less likely to be stopped by the police. So it's one of these things, when you look at kind of um, profiling in, in um, African-American communities, Hispanic communities in the United States, when somebody gets stopped, and then they search their car and they find, say, a bag of marijuana. This is how it happens, right? The difference, of course, is white Americans driving around are not being stopped, right? You can see statistically, if you just stop a group of people more and they're both doing the same thing, you can see where this goes. So the prison population expands dramatically. It leads to the emergence of the, what's referred to as the carceral state in the United States. Um, and un unfortunate comparisons, and in many ways accurate, if when you consider the fact of what prison, the prison population functioned after Jim Crow, right, after the Civil War, when one of the things that Southerners did to kind of deal with the fact that African Americans were free was actually to bring in prison labor, right? It was always this thing that was held up over the, over the heads of sharecroppers that if they didn't behave, they could end up in jail 
and then they would be doing the same job anyway, or they'd be leased out to other corporations, they do work for the state, this kind of thing. So where there was this incentive then to ensure in the South in the late 19th century, a sizable prison population to essentially be used as slave labor. Now, when you bring in the concept of private prisons, if your entire means of earning money and revenue is a constant expansion of the prison population, you can see how this creates economic incentives that from a societal level can lead to some serious problems and particularly with racial inequality. So that's one of the key effects that the crime bill has on not just American society, but the emergence of the carceral state, right? And like, this is partly why I chose the song by Tupac um, of Changes, right? For those of you that know a little bit about him, his mother was actually a Black Panther. I think she died just recently in 2016. So in that song, he basically covers a lot of the problems that you see emerge in the 1990s and in many ways haven't left. He talks about police brutality. He talks about the war on drugs. He talks about the unequal nature of the war on drugs, right? When he talks about both black and white smoking crack tonight, right? He's talking about the fact that blacks and whites are doing drugs at the same rate. And yet the prison population is exploding with African-Americans more so than it is white Americans, right? He talks about the racial divide. He talks about the fact that there is say a war in the Middle East, not a war on poverty, or he compares the war on drugs to the war on poverty. So the United States has moved from having a war on poverty to a war on drugs. Um, and the war on drugs, of course, doesn't really accomplish anything other than to massively increase the prison population. Combine that with the emergence of private prisons and then the crime bill that gets introduced in the early 1990s, it creates a recipe for it just to explode in the United States, which is what happens. So that's one aspect of Clinton's kind of domestic policy agenda, right? This is the part of Clinton that is kind of reaching more to that rightward direction. Now, the other way is how he embraces the kind of increasing marketization of American society. Now, the United States has always had a free market, even under the, the New Deal system. There's still a free market. It's just regulated um, to a certain respect. But now what you're seeing is market penetration into areas where the market didn't exist. Now, this can happen geographically with the fall of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but it can also happen within certain sectors and industries, student loans, higher education, all of these things become increasingly subject to the forces of the market for better or worse, right? So this is partly where we're going with this. So one of the things that's really interesting is to look at the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999. Now, Clinton, like Reagan, as I said, embraced the further deregulation of industry. He allowed the emergence, essentially, of investment banks and commercial banks. Now, this is a key thing in the United States. After the Great Depression started, one of the first things Roosevelt does is he separates commercial banks and investment banks. And he does this for a specific reason. Right? A commercial bank, as most of you know, are the banks that most people have contact with, with a direct relationship. It's the bank where you have your bank accounts, it's where you go to get a loan to buy a car, pay for university for some, or hopefully one day get a mortgage to buy a house. In short, commercial banks deal with loans and deposits. Now, an investment bank is a little bit different. They buy and sell stocks and bonds for individuals and corporations. They'll also help corporations issue IPOs or initial public offerings. So if, if you ever start a company and it becomes really big and you want to take it public, Often it's an investment bank that will help you take it public, right? So when all these big companies like Google, Apple, all these companies go public, I remember when Facebook was going public, there was this famous image of Mark Zuckerberg showing up on Wall Street in a hoodie and everybody's like, oh, how could he show up on a hoodie? But these, these investment banks exist in many ways. Part of their function is to help take corporations public, right? By selling shares and raising capital on the market. So you usually have to be incredibly rich to interact with an investment bank. Right? or you're a corporation investing with an investment bank. So why would Roosevelt and the New Deal Democrats separate them? And the basic reason is because investment banks take bigger risks. They're gamblers, and sometimes they can get things very wrong. Or if there's a stock market crash, they lose a lot of money. So part of the reason the government didn't want investment banks using or being merged with commercial banks was they were often using deposits from commercial banks to make investments, or at least at the very least using it as leverage on investments that they, or collateral on investments that they had made. Because if the investment bank fails, then it falls to the commercial bank as well. Now that was 1999. So what happens basically in 1999 is this, rule, the Glass-Steagall rule gets abolished. And now commercial banks and investment banks are allowed to merge again. Now there's debate about the effect that the repeal had on the 2008 financial crisis. Some economists such as Joseph Stiglitz contend that there was an indirect effect. Others such as Paul Krugman say the repeal was a mistake but that it wasn't really responsible. I use two liberal economists just to show you that it's not, 
necessarily thought of as conservative or liberal, but even liberal economists disagree on whether or not this had a direct effect on the 2008 financial crisis. Where it does have an effect, though, is it meant that the that the systemic problems inherent in the investment banks that took on these risky investments easily spread to commercial banks, but the actual merger of them didn't necessarily create the problem. Now, one of the consequences of this, and this is kind of key, is that it allowed banks to become absolutely massive. And I kind of touched on this um, last class. The American financial industry wasn't really that powerful in the 1960s and the 1970s. American manufacturing was kind of the backbone of the American economy. They were in the driver's seat, so to speak. Whereas today, financial services is really in the driver's seat of the American economy. You could say it's a kind of case of the tail wagging the dog, right? In the sense that finance and investment banks and commercial banks are absolutely necessary for a capitalist economy to function, no matter how involved the government is or isn't in the capitalist economy, so long as there still is the existence of a free market, they're necessary. But they, they should exist, or at least this is what a lot of his economists argue, they should exist as a kind of means to an end to keep the economy going. Whereas in the last 20, 30 years, it, the financial services industry has kind of become the end in and of itself. Um, which can lead to a lot of profits. It can lead to the city of London becoming um, it's a place of prominence that it has now, but it can also create imbalances within the economy, right? Partly why that, that manufacturing has further hollowed out, not just because of the deindustrialization of the 70s, but from an investment bank point of view, why invest in American manufacturing? It's expensive. Um, you're far better to invest off seas, right? And we'll get into more of how this happens a little bit later. So part of why Glass-Steagall is repealed, is the whole thing starts because Citibank wants to merge with an investment bank, Solomon Smith Barney. Now, Citibank helps, this helps facilitate the rise of banks that would and still are, even though probably more so now, too big to fail. It allowed the financial industry to amass a tremendous amount of power, even more than it already had. Um, traditionally, as I said, the American financial industry wasn't that powerful, partly because Americans historically, for reasons that have nothing to do with socialism or Marxism, have been and still are distrustful of finance. They don't see it as real work. Um, they don't see it as productive. They see it as a kind of alchemy um, that exists. And you saw this in the late 19th century, right? We looked at free silver and all these kind of people. But it goes back all the way to the founding of the United States. So now what you have is these gigantic banks and mergers and acquisitions in other parts of the industry that create a kind of massive um, kind of transnational corporations that have emerged over the 1970s. Now that's domestically. Now, of course, all of this is in many ways still connected to Clinton's foreign policy. So if we turn to foreign policy, Clinton's foreign policy reflected a kind of new democratic vision, um, this kind of embracing of America's newfound unrestrained ability to act in the world. Clinton's embrace of what would eventually become a commitment to encouraging the spread or defense of liberal democratic capitalism got off to a difficult start. The first intervention was in Somalia in 1993, where US soldiers were sent in to ensure aid was not intercepted by warlords, ended in absolute disaster. Uh, when U.S. special forces attempted to capture a major warlord, it ended with dead American soldiers being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu. Of course, this shocked the American public at this point. Now, this made Clinton a lot more cautious on the world stage. It's partly why he and the international community, partly, stood idly by during the Rwandan genocide. There was just no appetite for intervention. When, they were at, when the U.N. was asking for more troops, the United States wasn't really in a position to offer it. Um, and if the United States isn't going to do it, Often, very rarely, does anybody else offer troops. Um, this is changing a little bit now, but especially in the 1990s, if the US wasn't going to commit to something, most of the allies were not going to do it either. So by 1999, though, things had changed. Some of this had to do with the failure um, to act in 1994 in Rwanda, when the Clinton administration, along with European allies, most notably Tony Blair in Britain, conducted an air campaign to prevent ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. This was kind of the key aspect of American foreign policy under Clinton in the 1990s that in some ways is continued under Bush, although initially Bush is more skeptical of this. Right? There were also various military actions against Iraq in 1998 to enforce the no-fly zone. So now what you have is the United States really more so and aggressively acting on this kind of impulse to be the world's policeman, kind of doing exactly what George Kennan said they shouldn't do. Now, George Kennan is talking about communism, right? That you can't stand up to it everywhere because financially and from a resource point of view, it's just gonna become impossible, right? 
But Clinton's kind of doing the same thing, only it's not about fighting communism. It's supposed to be about standing up for freedom. And in some ways, things that some of the American public could get behind, like preventing genocide or ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, right? But it also creates the potential for the United States to get involved in too many different areas, something that especially after the Iraq war or 9-11 rather, will really come back to haunt the United States and contribute to a kind of imperial overstretch that you could call it, which we'll talk more about um, next lecture. Now, the other key thing for Clinton was where his influence is probably most felt is in trade. Clinton embraced free trade. Right, in this um, aspect of the kind of economic aspects of US foreign policy. In 1994, of course, he signs the North American Free Trade Agreement, with Canada and Mexico, that built on the free trade agreement of the late 80s between Canada and the United States. And by 1995, he helped create the World Trade Organization, which basically was an updated version of GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs um, in 1945, 1946, kind of what they always sort of envisioned. He also encouraged a deepening of economic ties with China, and he supported their admission to the World Trade Organization in 2001. The thinking at the time was that by encouraging the spread of the market economy in China, that democracy would follow. It was a kind of weird type of thinking, right? But again, think like Francis Fukuyama, right? People really believed that this was the end of history and they linked capitalism and democracy, which is odd when you think about it. Capitalism had existed in many non-democratic states before, Imperial Germany, Japan, um, prior to the militarism, and even in the United States and Britain in the late 19th century, countries where if we go by today's standards, we would not necessarily define as a democracy. And now, of course, we know in China that market liberalization and the spread of democracy do not necessarily go hand in hand. They sometimes go hand in hand, but not necessarily. And with regard to Russia, Russia found itself in this kind of weakened position and Clinton encouraged with American loans, market reforms, and American economists went over to Russia and started experimenting, selling off huge state industries. It's partly why Russia is in the position it is today. Uh, it's not just that it turned to kind of market-oriented reforms, it's how it did it. So in Russia, instead of basically gradually selling off state industries, right, saying, because you, you had this point where you had 200,000 state corporations run because the communist society run by the Soviet state were now sold off to private individuals, right? But instead of doing it gradually to kind of gradually bring this kind of centrally planned communist command economy into a more free market economy, they just did it all at once. So if we go back to that year of 1992, right? On, this, on um, December 31st or 30th, whatever it is in December, 1992, right? Soviet Union was communism. On January 1st, 1993, it was capitalist. And so what you had was this system where the state industries that were sold off got concentrated in very few hands. I mean, think about it this way. How do you convince a society where for 70 years has been told that owning private property to this extent was evil or doesn't understand what a stock market is? How do you convince them about the value of owning shares? And also who has any money? in Russia at this point. For the most part, it's people up high up in the Politburo. It's people who would have served as overseas ambassadors, people that worked in embassies all over the world who understood more how the market economy worked. Often they would take on loans from kind of Western banks and accrue tremendous amounts of power, which directly leads to the emergence of the oligarchs um, in Russian society. Russian society is kind of like, partly because of this capitalism gone completely insane. Um, in a lot of ways and how it functions. And of course, now it's this kind of um, like, uh, like organized crime in the state in Russia, um, legitimate business and organized crime in Russia is, is a very kind of overlapping gray area. Um, but for those of you that take Russian history, we'll learn a lot more about this. So what you're seeing then is the spread of that kind of, and this is why I'm calling it the kind of triumph of neoliberalism in the 1990s, partly because the other opposition party starts to embrace it. And of course, not just in the United States, right? Um, just like we did when we saw the emergence of um, the kind of new types of Republicans and then in the 1970s and 80s in Britain with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, we also see the same move in Britain with labor in the 1990s. So Blair's new labor sweeped to power in 1997 and took a similar approach to domestic and foreign policy that the Clinton administration took. Blair continued Thatcher's deregulation and denationalization. And in, the United, and, and in England, there was much more nationalization than in the United States, as some of you might, uh, would, might expect. And, but like Clinton, he was still a committed progressive, at least in theory. Indeed, up until the 1990s, university in Britain was largely tuition-free, 
um, until Tony Blair. I always thought it was Margaret Thatcher that did this, but it actually was Tony Blair that brought in kind of fees to go to British universities if you were a British citizen. So by the end of Tony Blair's term, Britain's kind of manufacturing was hollowed out even more so than the United States. Britain became a financial service powerhouse and London has become the kind of center of international finance even more so than New York, although Brexit could bring about an end to this. Um, um, particularly as financial companies, not all of them, but are kind of hedging their bets and moving out of London. And he embraced a similar foreign policy to Clinton, though he took it much further when a few years later he would follow George W. Bush into the disaster of the Iraq war. Now, to understand the significance of Clinton and Blair in the emergence of this new kind of economic system of governance is to go back and look at the words of Margaret Thatcher. So Margaret Thatcher was once asked what her greatest accomplishment was, and she replied, Tony Blair. And it just gives you a sense of how influential Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan are and were in American politics. That not only do they fundamentally change American politics and fundamentally change the kind of organization of the American state and the economy, but they also upend politics in the way that their adversaries now take a kind of, if you can't beat them, join them um, kind of thing. Now, this could all change, um, at least in the next 10, 15 years, nobody knows, but we, it's worth looking at the consequences of this turn in the United States. So if we think about the consequences of the move to neoliberalism, just like we thought about the consequences of the progressive era, the consequences of the New Deal era and all these things, the liberalization of trade with emerging telecommunications technologies like the internet created and intensified the emerging global production process that began in the 1970s as the neoliberal turn started. This new type of trade was different than what existed in pre-World War II or pre-World War I in the 1950s and 60s. The key difference is international intra-firm trade. So if we go back 120 years ago, there's a lot of global trade, almost as much as there is now. But the difference now is that it's something referred to as intra-firm trade. So you can have international trade between two countries, but it's the same company. When Ford builds something in China and ships it to the United States or vice versa, or shoes made by Nike are produced in China and shipped to the United States, that's international trade, but under the same corporation. This is what's different about international trade today, that corporations have become so transnationally oriented that trading amongst themselves within their same divisions actually contributes to international trade. Now, what this also does, of course, is companies now seek out the cheapest labor markets and loose regulatory frameworks. This further hollows out the American manufacturing, also in Canada and Britain, although Canada still has a fairly large manufacturing sector. Now, what does this all mean? Now, if we think of, we can think of neoliberalism in two different ways. I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. Different ways to think about it. We can interpret neoliberalism either as a kind of utopian project to realize a kind of theoretical design for the reorganization of international capitalism, or as a political project to reestablish the conditions for capital accumulation and to restore the power of economic elites. Now, on the one hand, neoliberalism hasn't really been that effective in revitalizing global capital accumulation, right? Growth has been slow since the 1970s. Now, this predates neoliberalism, so it's not entirely neoliberalism's fault. But neoliberalism has succeeded remarkably well in restoring, or in some cases, like in Russia and China, creating the power of an economic elite. In this reading, the utopian aspect functions merely as a justification and legitimation for whatever needed to be done to achieve this goal. So this is where we are by the end of the uh, 20th century, just before 9-11, that the United States is kind of sitting atop the world again, much like it did in 1945, although it is different. It's a different world, right? So the Union no longer exists. So it's hard to measure and compare what the place of the United States was in the late 90s versus the 1940s. In some ways, it was better in the late 90s in terms of its position in power. It's the only superpower. It doesn't have the Soviet Union to contend with, right? It doesn't have to worry about kind of um, demobilization um, within, um, within the defense industry. Although you do get, at least for about 10 years, what's referred to as the peace dividend, where defense spending in the United States decreases quite a bit, only to go up dramatically after 9-11, as you might imagine. So what we're seeing here is that kind of first 10 years of the end of history. And what we will probably see as well in the next lecture is that that end of history really only lasted about a decade. And once we get to the 21st century, it's hard to say when it ends. Is it 9-11? Is it the 2008 financial crisis? Is it the election of Donald Trump? Is it any one year that you could 50 years from now say this is when China became a global power? It's hard to say. We'll discuss these questions in the next lecture. So I'll leave it at that just for now. We'll take like five to six, seven minutes.
。ありがとうございます。Five to six minutes. Yeah, Abneet, you actually bring up an interesting dilemma here. Um, is 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 the the dangers that you've actually pointed out quite a bit of the entanglement between, say, the prison system and the government. Um, you'll also see this with the what happens with the financial industry in the early two thousands. How politics mixes with, say, mortgages and creates a problem. And in many ways, the politics was well intentioned. Right, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, but yeah, subsidies can sometimes serve this this function, um, so to speak. Right, that prisons prisons do get um, subsidies in many ways um, for these things. Or if you look at subsidies in Canada for the oil industry, right, um, which without which probably wouldn't function. Um, I mean, there's this interesting article that said, what if Canada spent three hundred billion dollars in subsidies on clean energy instead of the oil industry, what would it look like? Um, I mean, however a government is involved in the economy or not will affect it. Um, it's more about balance. Um, I think Kate pointed this out um, in the chat last, uh, last Friday, was that it's, you can't really think of it as government intervention or not intervention. It's really more of a spectrum, when to intervene, when not to intervene. And not intervening in many ways is a form of intervention by omission, right? It's incredibly complicated. Do you intervene on certain things and not others? Um, I don't have the answer for it. Um, it's, if I did, I'd probably not just be teaching this course. But it's one of these things that's incredibly complicated, which we're gonna get into in the next lecture a little bit. And then we'll also talk about um, not just the domestic ramifications of Obama and Trump. We'll also take a little bit to look at Obama's kind of grand strategy that he was trying to implement. And it's interesting because Obama often got accused of not being this kind of big strategic thinker when it came to kind of geopolitics. It's actually not quite true. You could make an argument, and um, historian Alfred McCoy makes this argument, that actually Obama is one of the few kind of grand strategy thinkers that exist in American foreign policy. Nixon's one of them. Uh, Dulles is one of them. Um, I'm trying to think who else is one of them. Uh, what's his name? Secretary of State under McKinley and Roosevelt. <laughs> the open door notes. Somebody look him up. Who was Secretary of State in 2001, or sorry, 1901 and 1902? Let's see, who was it? Anyway, we'll get into that in a minute. Let's put on the next song here. <laughs> 
John Hay. Yeah, you're right. Most of you <laughs> knew that song. Um, to echo what Kate said, uh, yeah, this was also my youth, although probably I was older than she was. Um, I actually, I'm gonna sound really old here. I remember when Green Day came out in 1994 and 1995. Um, but interestingly, I was actually at the concert that Green Day had in Toronto in 2004, the night of the 2004 election. Um, I can't repeat what Billy Joe Armstrong said about George W. Bush in this forum, but you can imagine what he said. Um, so yeah, this was for 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 me, who was in university during the Iraq or undergrad during the Iraq War. This song and this album were, was huge for obvious reasons, um, both in Canada and the United States. But yeah, um, a little emo, I guess. All right, let's get into the lecture here. Let me just check the chat. There's a few questions. Yeah, that was kind of a thing when Trump was running. Um, every time he picked a new song to use, um, with the exception of Ted Nugent, basically no band wanted him to use it. Even Elton John, who comes across as very political, but is in some ways not really, uh, started uh, was threatening to sue Donald Trump over this. Uh, but you know, but in, in some ways that is kind of self-defeating because that's the whole point of Donald Trump. Do something, have everybody tell you not to do it, and then fire up the base with I'm not allowed to do it. Um, so in some ways, it doesn't really serve that much of a function. Okay, we'll just get started here. I'm trying to go through the lecture um, fairly quickly. And, and again, you guys can, um, no, he did not want to be associated with Mike Pence, but he was friends with Donald Trump for a while. In fact, a lot of liberal celebrities were until all of a sudden Donald Trump started talking about politics. Um, so to speak. I mean, the only real position that Donald Trump's held that's been consistent for 30, 40 years is trade. Um, the stuff he was saying about China in the last five years, he was saying about Japan um, in the late 1980s. Yeah, yeah, Andy, they definitely did. Now, they've never been consistent, but that's the only one was trade, right? If you, you can go back and look at things that he did, uh, oh, and the race baiting. Don't forget, in the late 1980s, he took out a full page ad in the New York Times um basically i think there was there's a documentary on it uh or it's not a documentary i think it's ava duvarney made a a kind of mini series about the um the central park i think the central park five it's young african-americans who were wrongfully convicted of the of the rape and murder i think it was murder of uh, the central park jogger which dna evidence later exonerated all of them and um 
and basically uh, um, Trump took out an ad basically calling for the death penalty. Uh, he's never since apologized for that and probably never will. I think he was asked about it a few years ago and he said like he stood by it even though DNA evidence had gotten them off and, I, and the guy that actually did it has been caught and is in jail, but there you go. All right, so by the end of Clinton's term, neoliberalism had triumphed. Both political parties were largely committed to its aims. Under Clinton and the Democrats, it was a kind of softer version, at least in theory. Clinton wanted to use the expanding economy to fuse neoliberal economics with a kind of progressive ideals, um, especially socially. This was the beginning of the era in which the Clinton administration attempted to use the power of the American state to intervene abroad for humanitarian ends, at least in theory. But by the end of the 20th century, the United States had regained much of its confidence by this point, right? Um, it was kind of this sort of towering colossus again, or at least that was the perception. But that confidence, of course, was tested on September 11th, 2001. This changed the United States irrevocably, fundamentally in many ways altered the trajectory of where the 1990s were going. The combined shocks of 9-11, the 2008 crash, and now the coronavirus could possibly see an end to the kind of neoliberal led world order of the last 40, 50 years. What will replace it is anybody's guess. Could it be a kind of reborn neoliberal type style of economics? Could it be something completely different? Could it be like we're sort of seeing under Joe Biden a shift back to the kind of regulatory state of the mid 20th century? Often necessity is the mother of all inventions. Um, that's part of the reason why conservatives in the United States especially are so against climate change, because in order to solve it, it requires collective action on a global scale, something that not just Republicans, but Americans have had a hard time with. Um, part of the reason why the League of Nations was rejected in 1919, 1920, right? It was this idea of being subservient to a different sovereign body. Um, so why Donald Trump was so successful in talking about these treaties and trade agreements that had hemmed the United States in, saw it as an attack or an erosion on his sovereignty or the United States sovereignty. So we'll see uh, what happens. Um, certainly, the thing that will be true is that the world has changed in a way where something has to change. Which direction it goes in, I don't know. Um, but change is certainly in the air, whatever it will be. Okay, so let's start with George W. Bush, uh, a guy that was president for most of my undergraduate life. Now, the George Bush, under George W. Bush's administration, the cracks are kind of starting to appear in the kind of American-led world order, or more specifically, the kind of American-led neoliberal world order. Bush, as some of you know, was elected amid controversy. He was the first person to lose the popular vote and win the White House since the 1870s and 1780s, 1880s, sorry. But of course he won the Electoral College. He was seen as far more isolationist when he ran. Now that, that's something that kind of people forget about George W. Bush's presidency is understandably we focus so much on um, you know, what he does after 9-11. But there's this eight months when he's president from January of 2001 until August, early September of 2001, where he really wanted to pull back. He looked at a lot of the interventions that Clinton was doing um, and thought, you know, the United States needs to kind of pull back from the world, that maybe a lot of these interventions create more harm than good, right? It creates enemies, it's expensive. You know, the idea that the United States was gonna be the world's policeman and with the Republicans at this time and some Democrats on the left, of course, as, as most of you know, Bernie Sanders being one of them, right? Was this idea that the United States just can't be doing this anymore, right? That it's expensive, that it creates problems and like you can't really pick and choose where to intervene. And of course, it's a very easy thing to criticize understandably from both the left and the right, um, you know? partly because of its inconsistency. When is the United States acting to spread democracy and when does it have to compromise with that action for its own self-interest, right? If we look at countries that were say included in these interventions, but then other countries, we see this today, um, particularly we saw it under George W. Bush, Obama and Trump, when they'll talk about regimes, particularly in the Middle East, think George Bush's axis of evil speech, and yet Saudi Arabia, which is arguably less free than a lot of those countries, is not included. Um, or a country like the United Arab Emirates, which is not a democracy, but is a US ally. I'm not suggesting that they're evil countries in any way, but that there is no consistency about which country is deemed undemocratic and threatening, and which country is deemed undemocratic, but we need them, uh, kind of thing. Now, a lot of it comes down to just power politics. Um, Saudis have been American allies basically since the 1930s in many ways. But that consistency is very, very difficult to actually uphold, partly because if we go back to George Kennan, it's just impossible for a country, even as powerful as the United States, to be everywhere and anywhere. They're not and never were been 
omnipotent. So George W. Bush for those first eight months is kind of taking a more isolationist track. Obviously you're seeing the kind of triumph of the kind of evangelical Christianity in American politics that in some ways began under Reagan, although as we saw, Reagan was far more interested in the economic side of it than kind of implementing this kind of evangelical Christian agenda. Although he did use that and to contrast the United States with the Soviet Union being this kind of godless atheistic power, the evil empire, at least initially in the early 1980s. The biggest decision that George W. Bush made prior to 9-11 was the decision of whether or not the federal government was going to fund stem cell research. That was kind of the biggest thing. I remember when he had to take weeks to decide it, and he ended up with this compromised position, which is it's not that important what it was. But the key thing here is that was kind of the biggest thing that happened. And then, of course, all of this changes on September 11th, 2001, right? That in many ways, the kind of sins of the United States getting involved had come back to haunt it. Of course, as most of you know, Osama bin Laden was an American ally um, in the 1980s fighting the Soviet Union as the Mujahideen. There's a there's an almost comical or absurd parallel between him and Ho Chi Minh, right? If we think of that photo of Ho Chi Minh as an American agent in the 1940s fighting the Japanese only to be fighting the Americans 20 years later. Well, here we see the same thing with Osama bin Laden being funded by the CIA to fight the Soviets in the 1980s in Afghanistan, only to have the very thing that they were funding come back and end up becoming an enemy of the United States. Uh, of course, as most of you know, and I'm gonna skip over a lot here, in response, George W. Bush led a war on terror with several global consequences or severe global consequences. And two years later, under erroneous intelligence, launched a war against Iraq, which seriously destabilized the entire region in profound ways. In many ways, we're still living with how destabilized the Middle East became after the invasion of Iraq. Not just the fall of Saddam Hussein and the emergence of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which hadn't existed in Iraq prior to that, but the Arab Spring in many ways was a direct line from the destabilizing effects that the Iraq war had in that part of the world. So both domestically and internationally, the consequences of 9-11 and the war on terror sparked an intense backlash to the United States that gave rise to Islamophobia domestically and the West in general. Um, although in, in many ways, you know, as bad as it was in that time period um, when the, you got this kind of hysterical rise of Islamophobia, George W. Bush was careful in ways that Donald Trump is not, whether it be with um, people of Chinese descent in the United States or people of Muslim descent in the, or, um, descent in the United States, was very careful to constantly say he was not at war with Islam, he was at war with terrorism. Now, of course, he could say that, but the way it worked in practice, often many innocent lives were lost, hundreds of thousands, and many innocent people in the United States were locked up or put um, under surveillance or were the victims of hate crimes um, as a result of 9-11 and this thing. But there was, at least from a rhetorical point of view, an effort by George W. Bush to say it's not about everything, that Islam is a mission of peace and all this kind of, he had some he had some gaffes where he talked about having a crusade and not really realizing that crusade meant something very specific and not just a war, um, you know, an intense kind of war. And of course, people in the Middle East went, uh, crusade? What? What do you mean? Um, last time somebody said that, it didn't turn out that well. So George W. Bush, on the one hand, is trying to make a distinction, at least in theory, between terrorism and average is. Muslim Americans or Muslims in general. Bush framed the war as a struggle against freedom or a struggle for freedom, which in many ways makes sense, right? How can one be against freedom? It's a difficult thing to be against. But on the other hand, masked what was in many ways the true implications of 9-11, which was the misreading of somebody like Osama bin Laden's support. Not misreading bin Laden, but misreading why he had support in the United States, which I'm gonna get, or not in the United States, but in that part of the world to a certain extent. Now, if we remember, and I mentioned this earlier, if we go back to George Kennan, the architect of containment, right, that eventually is kind of run out of the State Department, Kennan argued, and we talked more about his, his uh, specific strategy then, but there was this other aspect to Kennan that was really quite interesting that I didn't talk too much about um, when we did the lecture in the late 40s and early 50s, although I touched on it by implication. Kennan in the 1940s, when talking about communism, argued that communism wasn't actually the problem. The problem was what he called Soviet imperialism. Communism, in his view, was simply the vessel or the means to promote Soviet imperialism, similarly to how the spread of capitalism was a means to spread American influence. There was a similar misreading of 
Middle Eastern critics of, US of the US global order. On the extreme end, of course, you have somebody like bin Laden who's engaged in acts of violence and violent rhetoric and all these kinds of things and financing terrorist cells all over the Middle East, Western Europe, United States, even places like Japan, Australia. But in many ways, that was, it was an extreme version of what many in the Middle East think, which is that the United States should get out and stop meddling in their country's affairs or propping up dictators. When the United States spoke of freedom, it rang hollow when some of the closest allies of the United States in the Middle East were anything but democratically elected leaders. Um, Egypt is a good example, right? Saudi Arabia is another good example. Basically all the Gulf states, Jordan, um, although it's certainly a lot more democratic now at the time, wasn't really. So on a deeper level, 9-11 was a challenge to the American led world order. As a result, like the Cold War, Islamic extremism or whatever we wanna call it for lack of a better word is merely a vessel, but the underlying cause is not a hatred or freedom of the United States, right? So the idea is, is that they were confusing essentially cause and effect, that they viewed Islam as the cause, when in reality it wasn't. The cause was American actions, and Islam was just a, a very potent vessel to spread skepticism about the United States. Religion is a very effective tool to unite millions, in this case billions of people, uh, potentially. You can see it with almost anything else, right? If we go back to the Middle East of the 1960s and the 1970s, it wasn't religion that was used by somebody like Nasser, it was Pan-Arabism, which is a bit more narrow, because when he's talking about Pan-Arabism, it's really just the Arab countries, right? But what about Indonesia, which is actually the largest Muslim country in the world? So by appealing directly to religion, somebody like bin Laden is able to reach people beyond a more narrowly confined world of the kind of Pan-Arab Middle East, so to speak. So a lot of what the United States did here, particularly under George Bush, but also with the Democrats, was confuse the cause and effect of it, that they saw Islam as the cause of something, when in reality it wasn't. It was merely a vessel to spread certain ideas that really had nothing to do with religion, so to speak. Now, if we look at the costs of the war, right? Some estimates place the cost of the war on terror by the end of George W. Bush and the beginning of Obama's in terms of trillions. Two years ago, it was reported by CNBC that the United States spent $6.4 trillion on wars in the Middle East and Asia since 2001. So if you think of the way the United States reacts to 9-11, the United States reacted to 9-11 by launching a global effort that would cost trillions of dollars, the lives of 4,000 US servicemen and women, and hundreds of thousands of dead Iraqis and Afghanistan civilians. So how much did 9-11 actually cost to plan? A few hundred thousand dollars is the estimates of what 9-11 cost. For a few hundred thousand dollars, the United States spent close to $6 trillion with its reputation in tatters, not to mention the erosion of civil liberties at home and its refusal to extend due process of law to so-called enemy combatants in the war on, on terror. This is where Guantanamo Bay, being the worst example of it, uh, began. And in many ways, what this leads to is a kind of imperial overstretch, right? That the United States is trying to fight everything anywhere and everywhere, focusing on these more imperial wars of police action, rather than focusing on great power politics, which of course is starting to emerge in this particular time period. So this is in many ways why the United States is often in the position that it's in today, when we think of it. Trillions of dollars spent on something that only cost a couple of hundred thousand. And if you think of war in terms of economics, right, then who won that? Right? If we go back to the Second World War, the United States is so successful, not because it has the best army, because it can produce so many things. Right? Even if we look at that kind of old adage of the Second World War of how you know, it was won by uh, British brains, American brawn, and Soviet blood. Right? It's a very British-centric way of looking at it, but there's a certain amount of truth to it. But even then, the Soviet blood, right? the equipment that the Soviets used was largely financed by the United States or produced by the United States. Right? So in many ways, if we think about it that way, that's partly why the US was able to be so successful back then. But if we look at the United States after post 9-11, they're spending $6 trillion on something that only cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to plan. It's an unsustainable type of action to take in the face of that. And it's not then surprising that it leads to financial consequences. Right? So what you're getting here is a kind of imperial overstretch, which is often what you see toward the end of an imperial led order, uh, not just the United States, but anyway, this is not, this doesn't mean that the United States empire is going to collapse um, in any way, shape or form. Um, but what it does mean is that 9-11, eventually the financial crisis, um, 
a lot of things that happened under Donald Trump, probably precipitated a decline in American power faster than it otherwise would have happened. Even so fast that it's even shocking the Chinese who thought that they could probably last another 20, 30 years with an American led world order and that slow rise of China would kind of happen gradually. But now the calculations have had to be rethought, especially under, under Donald Trump, where you probably saw a weakening of American power unlike anything you've seen in the last kind of 50, 60 years. Now, of course, parallel to the war on terror um, and Iraq was the slow brewing problem that would culminate in the economic collapse of 2008. Now, you guys are obviously, probably most of you, too young to remember, but in 2008, it looked like the global economy was going to crash and eventually bring about, people were talking about, a potential second Great Depression. Now, luckily, there was, for better or worse, and however problematic it was, a kind of bailout that at least kept the banks functioning. Had all those banks collapsed, and again, I'm not saying I'm a fan of the bailout, and there is, you can criticize the bailout from both the left and the right. Um, there's legitimate reasons for that. Um, but part of the problem was, had all those banks collapsed, you would have had a similar situation of 1929, where it would have cascaded. Um, and it would have happened a lot quicker nowadays because the global economy is so much more integrated than it was in 1929. So what happened? Well, the long and the short of it is bad debt and risky loans. Now, this was key. Since wages have been stagnating since the 1970s, how does the consumer economy survive, right? So you have some larger structural problems that exist beyond necessarily individual policies, but attempts by both well-meaning attempts by both Republicans, Democrats, liberals, and conservatives to try to encourage that consumer spending and maintain that standard of living that existed between 1945 and the 1970s, right? So if you can't, if wages aren't going up, but you still need a lot of people to spend money and buy things to keep the economy afloat, the only way that you can do this um, without raising wages is basically consumer debt. So without, ra raise, uh, without raising wages, there was a problem of consumption. So indeed the problems of the 1970s, if we go back to the emergence of neoliberalism, how it comes to be, how you get that kind of breakdown of the New Deal led global order, was that in the 1970s, the problem was at the point of production. Wages were too high. Too high, especially as the economy was contracting and becoming less productive. So the neoliberal turn in unshackling capital from the regulatory and international point of view solved this problem, but it left American workers with stagnated wages. So in some ways they had solved the problem of production, but, by, but created a problem of consumption, not intentionally, but it was the unintended consequences. So to maintain consumption, there is a kind of explosion of consumer credit. Instead of wages, people just went into debt to buy things and corporations, banks, and states with state support because it ensured the economy would continue to expand. The other key area, of course, is real estate. The economy of the last 30 years is largely built on consumer debt and the housing market, essentially debt and people selling houses back and forth to one another. So what we're seeing then is this increasing financialization of the economy, which becomes a problem because it doesn't actually produce anything of value. It transfers value around, right? This is why it is necessary, but you can't have an entire economy based on a financial industry, certainly not one the size of the United States. It could work for a city-state economy like Singapore, but even Singapore has a thriving manufacturing sector. So how does this relate to 2008? At a certain point, Everybody that is able to buy a house will have bought a house. So this is the point. Since the 1930s, under both New Deal liberalism and neoliberal liberalism, the American economy, or at least the buying power of the American public, the American consumer economy, has been built on people having access to home ownership. And you think of what comes with home ownership. It's not just owning a home. It's the few kind of pieces of capital that any individual actually owns. Most people right, in owning a home are become a kind of mini capitalist, right? So there's that little piece of capital that most people own is in the home that they own. Not necessarily in stocks, although some people own stocks as well, but home ownership is the backbone of the entire post-World War II expansion under both the New Deal and the kind of new neoliberal term. So at a certain point though, as I said, everybody that can afford to buy a house eventually buys a house, right? This is why in places like Canada and the United States, home ownership is about 67, 68%. Now this will probably change with my generation and probably your generation as well, but that's a largely what it is. And that's in some ways the highest instance of home ownership in the world, around 70%, particularly in the kind of um, Anglo economies of Britain, the United States, Canada, and Australia. So 
the key thing to understand about capitalism, it's kind of central flaw that even somebody like Marx missed was that it can't work without perpetual expansion. Once capitalism stops expanding, it stops working. That's why after 9-11, right? And again, you guys are too young to remember this. People stopped doing things for about a week after 9-11. Nobody bought anything. Nobody went to the store. George W. Bush had to go on television and basically told Americans it was their patriotic duty to go to the mall, right? So what that meant was it took about three or four days for the system to become too vulnerable. And that's the fascinating thing about capitalism that is in many ways um, seemingly contradictory or paradoxical. It is on the one hand incredibly vulnerable and on the other hand, incredibly robust. Vulnerable to being knocked down, but robust in being able to pick itself up again. And that's kind of the key thing, right? This is why if you look at kind of the, the, the large kind of mega capitalists of today, why they're so focused on space exploration. Um, it's, if capitalism is going to expand, then it's the kind of necessarily it has to go beyond the earth because that's kind of the key thing, right? How do you have an economic system of perpetual expansion existing in a place with finite resources? That's kind of the central dilemma of capitalism in the 21st century. There's two ways to solve it. Try to find balance, which is very, very difficult and complicated, or expand beyond the vessel of finite resources. Anyway, we can get into that a little bit later. So we're talking about houses specifically. So if you can't get more people to buy houses, that have already bought houses, what do you do? So the Bush administration in many ways with good intentions supported programs to allow the expansion of home ownership to groups that had historically low rates of home ownership, specifically African-Americans, poor whites, recent immigrants, Hispanic Americans, where the percentage of home ownership was actually quite low. The idea was like in the 1930s, 40s and 50s was to like they incorporated the white working class, not only into the consumptive aspects of the economy, but into the housing market. So the idea was to incorporate African-Americans, Hispanics, recent immigrants, and poorer whites into the housing market. As I said, how the house is often the only source of capital that most people possess, with maybe the exception of a pension plan, if you're lucky enough to have one. But because of the structural inequalities built into the US economy, many of which we've already seen, many of these people didn't necessarily qualify for mortgages. So banks were encouraged to relax their risk assessments. But what ended up happening was something that we call predatory lending. And it was the same kind of with African Americans, Hispanics, and poor whites and recent immigrants. On the one hand, many of these people were first generation home buyers, which meant there wasn't really anyone they could trust to go to for advice. When most people buy a home, if your parents owned a home, you go to them and say, okay, what do I do? This is very complicated, right? Or you're very educated in finance and, and banking and all these kinds of things, right? But if you're not, it's an incredibly scary and intimidating process. It's the most expensive thing you will ever spend money on and buy and own in your life. So it's a huge deal to do this. And if you don't have somebody that you can trust to talk to, you can potentially end up getting into some trouble or signing something that you don't fully understand the implications of. So like most people, when they were offered loans to buy a house, they thought, well, if the bank says I can afford to have this house, I must be able to afford to have this house. Why would the bank lend money to somebody that can't pay their mortgage? But herein lied the problem. The people that issued the mortgages turned around very quickly and sold them to big investment banks like Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, uh, these kinds of banks. So they didn't really care that the mortgages were predatory. They didn't really care, the mortgage brokers, that the person they were issuing a mortgage to wouldn't be able to pay their mortgage in five, six, seven years. Especially, and this is key, the rate of interest potentially changed. You weren't locked into a low rate of interest. So when they signed on the dotted line to get their mortgage, a lot of these people signed on an interest rate that they could afford, not fully understanding that in five years, six years, those mortgage rates could go up and their house would all of a sudden become more expensive. And this is where you started to get defaults. So what you have then is the person issuing the mortgages, it, which is the person assessing the risk of the mortgages, three days later sells it to somebody else. So there's no incentive for that person to really care about the risk because it goes on. All that person is focused on is making money by issuing mortgages, getting more mortgages, signing more people up for mortgages, and then they'd load it off on somebody else, the big investment banks. And this is how they were able to make lots of money. This is why in the, if you look in the notes, if you watch the movie, The Big Short, they actually explain this way better than I'm explaining it. 
So what happens then is when the big investment banks like Goldman Sachs get them, they bundle these bad mortgages together with lower risk mortgages and package them into collateralized debt obligations or CDOs. You don't need to remember all the details of this. And then sold them to their clients, pension funds, institutional investors, wealthy investors, um, these kinds of things. Now, when these, And again, part of the reason these mortgages were predatory was because the rate of interest that they start paying was low, would start to go up until they couldn't pay it and then they defaulted. Meanwhile, the big banks knew that these mortgages were bad, so they took out insurance on them. One company issued almost all the insurance. So AIG, American International Group, one of the largest insurance companies in the world, issued what's called credit default swaps. So a company like Goldman Sachs then looks at their CDOs and then knows that they could potentially default. They then take insurance out that if it goes bad, they have insurance to cover it. The problem was AIG took almost all of these credit default swaps. So when people started defaulting and when the housing economy started to crash and the banks then and institutional investors went to get their insurance, AIG collapsed because they couldn't pay it because they took on too much risk. When AIG collapsed, then all the other banks collapsed and it cascaded from there. And it spread beyond the United States into Europe and almost everywhere. Even countries that were kind of smug when this first happened were kind of like, oh, this is an American problem. And then five or six months later, it became their problem as well. So the point of this is, is that the end of history doesn't really last long. You could say it ends in 2001 when US military might was challenged and precipitated an expensive war on terror. You could say in 2008, the vulnerability and consequences of deregulation partly led to it, partly. Um, and all of this, all of this kind of these catastrophes of the early 21st century, of course, create space for the United States to elect its first African-American president in Barack Obama. Now we're gonna look at Obama and Trump and what they mean for the United States. And perhaps more importantly, what they mean for the world. Now, of course, what we're getting here between Obama and Trump, and again, I'm gonna remind you of this as it might be on the exam, is the two traditions of American national identity and nationalism, right? We've already talked about this, so I'm not gonna to get too much into it. We have civic nationalism on the other hand and ethno-racial nationalism on the other. And again, Trump is a very different kind of Republican, right? A lot of things that were bubbling underneath the surface of the, of the Republican party explode when Donald Trump um, comes onto the scene in 2016. So we have in many ways, Obama and Trump are two perfect exemplars or personify these traditions almost perfectly right? Whatever their limitations. Obama in many ways is the exemplification of or the personification of that civic nationalism. His very identity and the very fact that he was elected president speak to this tradition of a kind of American multiculturalism. And Donald Trump's election speaks to the tradition of the kind of American ethno-racial nationalism. Not to the same extent that it was 100 years ago, but this idea that there are real Americans and people pretending to be Americans, so to speak. Right? So Obama in many ways unleashes the kind of civic nationalism and hope that kind of had an occasion to kind of remobilize these kind of racial nationalist forces. In many ways, Trump is a reaction to Obama, much like how Jim Crow was a reaction to radical reconstruction in many ways. In fact, if you look at the speech that I had you guys watch or read that I posted in the module section, Obama's a more perfect union speech that he gives as a candidate about race. Um, the historian Gary Gersel, who actually coins the term civic nationalism and ethno-racial nationalism, called it one of the most profound meditations on race in America ever given by a public figure. It's not to say that it's more profound than work people have been doing for decades on this, but you've never heard an American politician talk about race that way. And somebody, only somebody like Obama could do it. And part of the reason he does it is because it was kind of a make or break moment for him. It was when the Jeremiah Wright stuff came out and his former pastor was on TV saying, God damn America. And you know, he has this line in the speech where he says, I can no more condemn Jeremiah Wright than I can my white grandmother who made me wince a few times when she told a racist joke or used a racial slur. And this is why in many ways, Obama was the perfect person to deliver this message, right? So that's the kind of thing. But Obama's election, as we know, right? precipitated a kind of similar anger among certain sectors of American whiteness that this idea of white privilege was starting to erode, right? Both of these traditions are inscribed in American history, right? The 1790 law, the three-fifths clause, slavery, but then also there's the civic nationalism of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that all men are created equal. So Obama's 2008 speech on race in many ways is the embodiment of that civic nationalism. Now, if we look at Obama on the world stage, I'm just gonna do this quickly. And then we'll get to Trump and then try to wrap everything up. If we look at Obama on the world stage, um, 
again, he was often accused of, of kind of retreating on foreign policy. It's actually not true um, in many ways. And to understand Obama's grand strategy, you have to understand a man named Halford Mackinder. Um, now, Halford Mackinder was basically an academic in the early 20th century who invents the concept of geopolitics in 1904, right? He groups Africa and Asia and Europe together, and he calls it this landmass, the Eurasian World Island. And basically, he said it's the pivot point or the axis upon which world power is built. Now, his basic argument is that whoever can control the Eurasian World Island, right, Northern Africa, this part, can control the entire world. Now, no empire, no power has actually been able to do it. The country that got closest is the United States. And I'll explain a little bit how that works, and then we'll get to like, what does this mean for Obama? So if we look at the United States here, right, you could argue, and Alfred McCoy actually makes this argue, this historian, I think he just recently retired. Um, I think it's in the book, um, In the Shadow of the American Century, it's where I stole the title from. It's in the, if you look at the syllabus, it's actually in there. What he basically argues is that the, the United States came closest to controlling the Eurasian world island, but it didn't actually control it. And part of the reason is because the United States is a maritime power, not a land power. So if we look at how did it do it? Well, let's look at the United States geopolitical grand strategy during the Cold War, right? So if you look at it, what the United States does is it kind of bisects the Eurasian world island. These are kind of all the US defense pacts that exist between 1947 and 2014. So you've got Europe, right? Before the end of the Cold War, it ended at Germany. You've got Japan. And one thing that's not on here is a Southeast Asia defense pact, but that's also one. Um, it's Southeast, I think it's called the ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N. Um, defense pact of like uh, Thailand, um, Malaysia, the Philippines a defense pact with the United States. So what you have then is the Eurasian world island. The United States was able to control the Western and Eastern periphery, right? This kind of peninsular periphery here with Europe and the kind of maritime periphery of Asia here with bases in Japan, South Korea, um, Taiwan, um, the Philippines um, and Australia. And of course, that's just the first line. There's also a bunch of islands here where the United States has bases. Guam, a lot of these islands are, of course, acquired by the United States in the war against Japan and the Pacific, right? So these are kind of the defense packs. If we look at countries and territories with US troops, so if the dark blue, um, obviously including the United States, has US troops of over a thousand. So Spain, Iceland, the United Kingdom, West Germany, Italy, um, some of the kind of um, Southeastern European countries, Turkey, Iraq, obviously, um, Yemen, Afghanistan, Japan, South Korea, all of these countries have over a thousand US troops stationed in them. The light blue countries have US troops, but less than a thousand. I mean, look at how many there are. And again, how it bisects the Asian world island or the Eurasian world island. And by 2011, the US Air Force and the CIA had ringed the Eurasian landmass with 60 drone bases for munitions and surveillance. Now that's the military aspect of it. Now, where the economic aspect comes in is really interesting because for those of you that have studied US empire, one of the key things about the US imperial led world order is that on the one hand, yes, the United States has had formal colonies like Cuba, like the Philippines, Hawaii even, although it's a state now, Puerto Rico, which is still in this kind of area of limbo, right? This is being tested against China's Belt and Road Project, right? If we look at it here, essentially creating the Silk Road on steroids, so to speak. So what China is trying to do is essentially reorient the economic axis of the Eurasian world island so that everything, kind of like for those of you who study Roman history, right? All roads lead to Rome. The idea is that all trade in this part of the world will lead to China. Right now, it's a risky venture, and in many ways, it's not entirely clear if it's if it will succeed, especially the way so much of the debt has been structured against some of these countries. Although you could argue that that's part of the point. What China does is it goes into a place like Pakistan or Sri Lanka, and it finances a gigantic kind of port system, or in some cases, a military base. So for the most part, they've been reticent about overseas military deployments, with the exception of Djibouti. Here, there's a there's a Chinese uh, naval base, but that's also connected to the piracy in the Gulf of Aden, which is a kind of international effort, right? So what you're seeing here then is these massive debts. So the idea is that if a country like Sri Lanka can't pay off the debt, then it transfers to Chinese ownership, which you could argue is part of the whole plan, right? China understands in many ways American power better than Donald Trump does in the sense that the United States, even though it's been a military power for all this time, usually has been more effective at exercising power through the preponderance of power it holds in the global marketplace. Economic incentives and disincentives is one way how the United States is able to effectively wield influence and imperial power, right? I think Kenneth. So 
In order to stop this, right, of having the kind of big economic centers and manufacturing centers of Europe and East Asia connected, right, the United States has to figure out a way to stop this. So Obama's grand strategy was essentially using trade. And this is where it eventually relates to Donald Trump. The first was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right? So the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a continuation of this idea to bisect the Eurasian world island, right? to bring the defense packs that the United States has with a lot of these countries into an economic orbit. So what the US is doing with the TPP is essentially creating free trade agreements amongst the Pacific Rim countries, not all of them, right? Japan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Singapore, Chile, Peru, Mexico, and Canada. Now, of course, the United States isn't in it anymore because Donald Trump took them out of it. It represents $28 trillion or 40% of the global economy. The idea is to tether Pacific Rim economies to the US economic orbit and away from China's economic orbit. That's one thing Trump didn't understand about it. Now it's a double-edged sword, right? Because it's the, the labor historian in me is thinking, though, this will be a real big problem because what's going to happen to labor standards, right? Is this just going to be another means for the offshoring of American jobs? Probably in some respect, uh, right? Professor, but I don't mean to interrupt from a political point of view, it's the United States again using its economic power for an imperial end, right? To tether all these countries. Because, of course, and this is the thing Trump never talked about, was the one country that is not involved in the TPP is China. It was meant to kind of pull these countries more into the US economic orbit or access of it. That's one aspect of it. But of course, Trump ends the TPP or US participation in it as soon as he gets elected. But it still exists. So all of these countries are in it without the United States. Will Joe Biden go back in it? Probably not. Or if he does, he'll do it later and call it something else because of the leftward turn in the Democratic Party. <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice that, that Alaska was, uh, yeah, in this map was made part of Canada. Now, that's one aspect of it. The other lesser known aspect, most of you probably heard of the TPP during the presidential election, is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And this is a free trade agreement with the United States and Europe, right? So you can kind of see here then what the grand strategy that Obama was doing with this pivot to Asia is that it mirrors that military strategy of the US kind of bisecting the world island, right? And it's this interesting thing where somebody like Obama, especially, like I'd be shocked if he ha hadn't read Harford McKinder. Now, if we look at what it looks like, right? So here's the total trade agreement partners. You have the United States, if the United States had stayed part of it, right? You have the Pacific Rim economies here, tethered to the United States, a few in the Middle East and Western Europe. So you can see exactly what's happening here. Obama's following Helford McKinder's idea that what this is about is preventing China from marshalling the forces, the economic and resource and military forces of the Eurasian world island and to reorient the globe's economic orientation of access towards China. What the United States is doing is pulling it away. Now, what's interesting about this too is that it's, 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 it's if you get the United States and China out of it in terms of like the specific countries, in many ways, what we're going to see here is playing out of what happens when maritime powers confront land powers. And it'll be really interesting. In the, in the last 500 years, maritime powers have usually been far more successful. Now, this could change in the 21st century, especially when air power becomes a factor, right? If we look at American military power here, on the one hand, they still have a lot more military assets than China does, at least in theory. But on the other hand, if we think back to our 9-11 comparison of a couple of hundred thousand dollars, right? Precipitates a $6 trillion war on terror. What happens if China sinks an American aircraft carrier with a missile that costs $5 million, right? It sinks a piece of American state asset that's $6 billion, right? So this is something that's very interesting. Um, that will happen at least in the next 20, 30 years to see how this will work. It'll also be interesting to see if the United States does rejoin the TPP or if it does call it something different. Um, it's unlikely that it will. The Republicans in a much more nationalist lens don't want to be part of it. And the Democrats from a more left-wing perspective don't want to be a part of it, or at least initially don't want to be a part of it. Necessity uh, might change things. And of course, things like Brexit further erode this kind of interesting thing when you look at it, which leads us to Donald Trump. And we'll get there in just a minute. Um, these are also countries that have signed cooperation agreements with the Belt and Road Initiative. So again, you can see this overlap here um, that maybe it won't be a kind of binary struggle between China and the United States. I mean, of course, because it's different during, than during the Cold War. I mean, the key difference is that the United States and the Soviet Union 
didn't really trade with each other very much. Um, it, a probably better example is like the British Empire and Imperial Germany pre-World War I, where there was a lot of trade between the two countries and they ended up going to war anyway. But of course, the big difference between then and now is for better or worse, nuclear weapons have been around for 70 years. Now, on the one hand, it makes the world dangerous, but on the other hand, it means that the implications of two global powers like the United States or China or Russia going to war is unfathomable, right? It's not gonna be fought over there. Everybody's gonna be affected and it could potentially lead to the obliteration of human civilization. So you could make an argument that nuclear weapons, at least in the control of large states, could prevent this potentially. Now, the, the fear with nuclear weapons is the proliferation. And when you get somebody using them who isn't a large state like China or the United States that has something to lose. Now, that brings us to Donald Trump and racial nationalism. Now, on the one hand, again, Donald Trump saw the P TPP through the lens of nationalism and the kind of this idea of, well, why are we allowing these countries to trade with us like this? Right. A lot of this begins with the Tea Party, which ostensibly starts as a kind of economic critique, but that the kind of racial populism was certainly always not beneath the surface, but right out of the surface. And this is different than Bush, right? Even on immigration, George W. Bush, for all his horrible flaws, sought a path to citizenship for the 12 million estimated illegal immigrants in the United States. And so this was a shift in the Republican Party away from where the Republicans initially at least the elite of the Republicans wanted to go, right? Now, of course, this move towards a resurgent nationalism is not just in the United States. We're seeing it all over the world, right? You see it with Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, Xi in China. You see it with Mar the rise of Marine Le Pen in France, uh, in Germany, you're starting to see the rise of a kind of more uh, muscular right wing. The current chancellor of Austria kind of flirts with some of the right wing parties. And of course, in, or I should say, I shouldn't say right wing, but nationalists, and of course, in Great Britain with Brexit, um, which is really interesting. Now, what's interesting when you think of Trump, when you think of his kind of strategy that he's employing, is that he wanted countries to pay the cost of American troops being deployed there. And this is one area where Trump on the one hand didn't quite understand the way American imperial power was exercised. He was engaging in what the great historian William of Appleman Williams called the US's grand illusion. He said, quote, the charming belief that the United States could reap the rewards of empire without paying the costs of empire and without admitting that it was an empire. This is in many ways the mistake that Donald Trump made, much to the consternation of the Chinese not fully like thinking like, what is this guy playing us? Like, what's he doing? Like he's making it easier for us um, in many ways. This is a lot of what informs Trump's kind of, if you want to call it a grand strategy, it's more haphazard um, in that respect, which is really something interesting. Oh, you want me to repeat the quote, Jennifer? Is that what you want? So I'll read it again. William Appleman Williams said, he's not talking about Trump, but you could apply this to Trump. Quote, the charming belief that the United States could reap the rewards of empire without paying the costs of empire and without admitting that it was an empire. In many ways, this is what Trump was trying to do, right? Like on the one hand, he has a point. Empire is expensive, right? Deploying thousands of troops in, in thousands of troops in Vietnam, in, in Japan, in South Korea, in Europe is incredibly expensive. But there's this failure on both the left and the right to understand how much of American prosperity is actually built into like hard power that there are some people and again it's and it's a left-wing and a right-wing phenomenon that the last 50 60 years was based on this flat world of an open market and that's true to a certain extent but the market was always meant to serve american grand power or at least american grand strategy right remember during the cold war we talked about how that imbalance happens when economic decisions were subservient to geopolitical it was a means to an end and there is this kind of kind of naive belief on both the right and the left that the United States can have this world order without it being backed up by force, which has almost never been true. Um, liberals in that way are kind of naive about the world they can build and conservatives are kind of naive about how much power the United States actually possesses and whether or not it needs these deployments to maintain that power. I'm not saying it's good or bad either way, it simply is the way it is. And this was something that Brexiters in Britain didn't really understand as well. And it's the irony of that there's this fear of loss, right? The erosion of not just American, but Western power on the global world vis-a-vis -a, -vis a rising China or India or the non-Western world. The irony, of course, is that Brexit actually makes the United, the United Kingdom far weaker um, outside of the European Union, something that they're realizing um, almost bitterly 
right? That they can't command the same kind of power. This belief that the United States was this, has this special relationship in many ways isn't true. The British believe it, the Americans don't. Um, in fact, American foreign policy directed toward Britain over the last 50 years is a means to an end. Britain was seen as a bridge to Europe, to France and Germany, or a balance towards French and German interests within the European Union. With Britain out of the European Union, Britain serves no function to American foreign policy, um, besides some kind of delusions of uh, re-emerging imperial power, which with their population, even though they're still the world's fifth and sixth largest economy, um, they're not gonna be able to maintain um, against the kind of colossal powers that are rising um, at the end of the Cold War, which is something to think of. Now, the final thing that we're talking about here quickly um, is, the effect of social media in the future of the nation state. I'm just gonna do this quickly. I'm not gonna to get to, into too, uh, too much about it. Most of you that have studied Benedict Anderson is this idea that nations are imagined communities that are solidified through the rise of what he calls print capitalism, right? Why we in Toronto feel any connection to somebody in Vancouver is we all have understand the same story. I think somebody mentioned this class that kind of intersubjective understanding of what it means to be Canadian, that there's a, there's a, there's a narrative that links everybody, right? The internet, social media, YouTube, all these things is fracturing that. So the effect that this will have on the nation state could be potentially profound. I mean, if Facebook were a country, it would have 2.5 billion users. And this is far more profound than simply people talking to each other, but how you can seek out like-minded people on the other side of the world, which on the one hand is there's a certain utopian quality to it, but on the other hand could lead to the fracturing of the nation state for better or worse, depending on how you think of it. Now, the other large question then, if we look at the future of the United States is which one will triumph? America first or a more perfect union? Now, on the one hand, I'm obviously oversimplifying this. It's more complicated um, than this, but there's a few possibilities. Do we see the triumph of Trump's kind of racial nationalism, which we're seeing in, the, in certain Republican controlled states today with the, the kind of move towards voter restriction that by people who study American election law is essentially a return to kind of Jim Crow voting restrictions, although in a less obvious way. But even some of those Jim Crow voting restrictions, if you remember, were not overtly centered on race, right? It was poll taxes. It was things like, um, uh, we call it like your ability to read and write, right? Literacy. Could you understand? Did you, could you, you had to take a literacy test to vote. So it was never directly about race, even in the Jim Crow era. So we're starting to see more of that. Um, in places like Georgia. And it's interesting how corporate America is responding. Are we seeing the abandonment of the Republican party by corporate America? Uh, people tend to think of corporations as trying to leaning more right. And it's not exactly entirely true. Corporations above all want stability, more so than they want anything else. And you could make an argument that the current Republican party represents anything but stability. Now this has important implications for the Democratic party. Does the Democratic party moving left pull America to a more progressive left leftward lean? Or because there's only one political party that is at least predictably friendly toward American corporations, does it lead to the increasing neoliberalization of the Democratic Party? It's hard to say. Could we see the triumph of racial nationalism, at least in the short term? Or, and what is likely the only credible future for the United States, is to build that multiracial democracy that the radical Republicans envisioned in the late 1860s and early 1870s, right? Now, if we look at both Obama and Trump on foreign policy, it's really interesting. They both recognized the waning of American power, but responded in different ways. For Trump, it was more of a backlash. Obama and probably even some Republicans that are not like Trump would see it more as a managing it downward, right? That Obama recognized that building and preserving international institutions could allow the U.S. to maintain influence even as its economic power shrinks. Trump, of course, doubles down on this kind of adversarial system, which could lead to imperial overstretch, but the only thing that tempered Trump's kind of vision was a kind of unwillingness or reticence to get involved in military interventions. And now with the emergence of the coronavirus, we're seeing a reassertion of state power, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1930s and the 1940s, not to the same level, but this could be the kind of final nail in the coffin of neoliberalism. The problem of course, is that other than an older idea, there's no new idea to kind of take shape. And it kind of leads to this famous quote by a Marxist named Antonio Gramsci. And he says, and he's talking about the 1920s and the 1930s. And he says, quote, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. So it's just, an, I don't mean to leave it off on this kind of depressing note, because the one thing to remember is even though that was true in the 19th, 20s, the 1930s, the 1940s, eventually it does lead to that post-World War II economic boom, that emergence of prosperity 
Um, nobody knows what the next 10, 15, 20 years is going to look like. And in many ways, it's your generation that it's really gonna be up to. The baby boomers messed it up. My generation basically squandered any attempt to try to fix anything. Maybe it's because we're raised by the baby boomers, I don't know. But you guys are probably raised by Gen X. Um, so you'll bring a kind of different perspective um, to this. But it's one of these things that whatever you believe in, left, right, center, is you can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. You have to, you have to fight for it, like people did in the 30s and 40s, 50s, like people like Hayek did waiting for this kind of um, economic crisis to emerge in the 1970s and eventually implementing his vision. So you have to push for it. Um, you can't sit back and allow it to happen. And the last thing I'll say before we end here, and I know some of you have to go to tutorials, so um, feel free, uh, feel free to go, and you can watch it later. I just want to say that you guys did really well, um, given the terrible circumstances under which we have to do this course. I know doing it online in many ways is more convenient. Many of you are probably in your pajamas in your room, which is great. Um, but on the one hand, like it's not the same thing as a live lecture, um, even for me, like I can't read your reaction. I don't know when I'm boring you, um, so to speak. There's no energy in the room to the same extent that there is. Um, hopefully, maybe by next January, we'll be back in the classrooms. Um, so I just wanna say you guys did a really good job given really difficult circumstances. Um, and I hope you really enjoyed this course. I tried to make it relevant to um, the way we're talking about um, in general. <laughs> we have to cut down this generational hate. Well, at least in my case, it's self-hating. Um, and again, when we talk about generations, it's not entirely the baby boomers' fault. Everybody loves to crap on the baby boomers, but you gotta remember, they were 20 years old in the 1960s. They didn't create that world, right? They weren't the ones making the decisions in, um, in, uh, in the late 1970s about what to do about the global economy. Um, so it's, 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 it's more complicated than that. And also what baby boomers are we talking about? Baby boomers in Canada, United States, baby boomers outside of the Western world is a completely different calculation. Um, what about African-American baby boomers, right? Who certainly didn't reap the rewards that that post-World War II generation got um, for white baby boomers. So it is a lot more complicated. And it's also true that every generation criticizes the generation that came before and criticizes the generation that will come after. You guys will do it too. Um, you guys, when you get old enough and have kids, we'll start talking about all these new kids, you know, they don't understand or anything, they're lazy, all this kind of stuff. And the one thing I would submit is that they say this about everything, right? They said it about jazz music in the 20s, they said it about television in the 1950s, and we're saying it about now. The point is, human society has a tremendous capability to adapt to almost any situation, for better or worse. Um, so whatever happens, um, just remember the generations that came before went through tremendous upheaval and still had babies, right? Still had great experiences, still fell in love, still traveled, still did all these things. So, um, you know, it's the future isn't always bleak uh, in that way because you never really know what's going to happen. Um, history often takes a left turn uh, when you ex think something is going to go a certain way. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. I will hang around for a few minutes if you have a few questions. Um, I'm not having my office hours today, but if you do want to get together and chat over the week, I, we can certainly make a make an appointment. Thank you, Professor, for everything. And if you guys are looking for summer courses, um, there is a history of capitalism course that I think you'd all be really interested in. Um, I'm, I won't be teaching it. Uh, my former supervisor, Rick Halpern, is going to teach it. I'll probably run one of the tutorials and maybe do a few of the lectures. Um, so um, it's, it's a lot of what we did in this course will actually prepare you well for it. It's a first year course, so it's big. We start all the way at the beginning of um, like the plague and the collapse of feudal order in Europe through slavery, all the way up to the revolutions, the emergence of industrial capitalism, the market revolution, through laissez-faire, through regulatory capitalism, all the way up till today. Um, so if you're looking for something in the summer, if you're bored and want something to do, it's actually a really great course. And it's a really great course to get you thinking about the big picture um, of, uh, of, the, of world history. Now, obviously it's a little bit Western centric, which we're trying to get more material outside of Western Europe um, and the rest of the world. Um, but we do talk about empire, slavery, and all these kinds of things. So anyway, uh, have a good, good luck on the exam. You will get your papers back about, I think, the day before the exam is due, so the 19th.
Oh, Kayla, go ahead. Um, hi, I sent you an email this morning. I was just wondering if you'd be able to get back to me. Yeah, I'll be able to get back to you. I just saw it. I'll be able to get back to you um, in this afternoon. All right, thank you. All right, no problem. 